I've organised this session because I know so many people across Wales want to see change and it's so hard to make it happen. Many community groups are campaigning on various things. There's so much energy and enthusiasm and yet it doesn't seem to reach the government. It doesn't seem to have much effect sometimes. So I wondered if there's something missing because things aren't working as well as they could. And I organised this session to investigate that. How do we get the right people lined up in the right order so that we get the change we want to see? So that's the thinking behind this afternoon's session. And I'm excited by the speakers we have today. Camilla Saunders is from uh, Knighton. And Camilla came to me through a friend of a friend. Actually, it's a very happy, um, happy accident. And um, I think I'll let, let Camilla explain for herself the, the wonderful work that she's involved with in, in Knighton. So over to you, Camilla. And I'm sort of roughly timing you for 10 minutes. OK, thank you. Well, thank you, Jane, for organising this session and, and, and letting, letting me speak. Um, so, yeah, um, I live in Knighton, which is just across the border um, from Shropshire. And I'm part of a group called Sustainable Food Knighton. And I'm just going to give you a bit of background on how we started and why and what we've been up to. Uh, we've been going about two, two and a half years. So our local town council declared a climate emergency in April 2019. And we all felt quite excited about that and inspired. But shortly afterwards, Karen in our group discovered that an application to build an IPU, that's an intensive poultry unit, had been submitted by a hunter farm at the edge of town, and it was supported by our town council. And this seemed so totally wrong and counterproductive because we know that intensive agriculture is one of the biggest sources of greenhouse gas emissions globally. We felt we had to do something and thus Sustainable Food Night and was born. I don't think any of us realised at the time what a huge task we were taking on and I think it's just as well because we probably wouldn't have even started. And although lots of different people have given us much valued support at different times, there are actually only four of us in the core group and I think we're all here today and I hope the others will say something as well. We've all learnt a lot. Now Paris has been dubbed the poultry capital of Europe as the proportion of intensively reared chickens to humans in, is the highest known in the continent. That's about 64 per person and rising. So we, we set to, we researched the effects of nitrates and phosphates in chicken poo that kill off plants and pollute rivers. Uh, also nitrogen combines with oxygen to produce nitrous oxide, which is a major greenhouse gas and sticks around longer than methane actually. Chickens are fed a concentrated feed, which is based on imported soya, which means we export the emissions to other countries. Um, and soya cultivation uses lots of water and is contributing to deforestation and social unrest in South America. Ammonia, which also comes off IPUs, can travel through the air on particulates and cause or aggravate lung and heart disease. And while one chicken farm miles from a central population might not be very harmful to biodiversity and human health, the cumulative effect of the hundreds of chicken farms in Paris is significant and shocking. As for the chickens, they lead short, unpleasant lives imprisoned in sheds. They're not even given the dignity of being called animals, they're referred to as a crop. So we had help and advice from CPRW, that's Council for Protection of Rural Wales, who've done a lot of work on, on intensive poultry units, and an excellent planning advisor, Helen Hamilton. We raised funds and commissioned Helen to write an objection and tried to gather as many other objections from local people as possible. Sadly, the Welsh Government, local councils and the NFU are actively encouraging farmers to build IPUs as a form of diversification so that family farms can keep going. But in fact, only farmers who've got capital or are able to obtain large loans can even think about taking them on. It's a huge amount of initial layout. The farmers don't own the units. They're tied into a contract with a big corporation. And round here, it's usually Avara, which is a merger of Cargill, Buhis and Fashenda, who provide the chicks and feed, collect them for slaughter and dispose of diseased or, or prematurely dead animals. The chicks grow very fast on the soil and they're deemed ready to slaughter after 36 days and they can hardly move by then anyway. We also discovered how opaque the planning process is. Any time you want to view an objection to a planning application, at least in POIS, you have to make a freedom of information request as the council refused to publish them on their website, citing data protection. And in January 2019, Paris Council changed their own rules so that planning officers can make a decision on an application under delegated powers without it being heard by the full committee. And in theory, if the applications are for an IPO of a certain size, it should be heard by the full committee, but you're never sure about that. So we complained about lack of democracy, but that was to no avail. Then there's the matter of existing Welsh legislation. For a start, the Welsh government declared a climate emergency in April 2019 and published Prosperity for All, a low carbon Wales, 
And this states the need for, I quote, reducing the impact on our natural resources, which does not mean increasing animal numbers and intensifying farming, end of quote. The Welsh Government also passed the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act for Wales in 2015, requiring all public bodies to think about the long-term consequences of their decisions. It's a really wonderful piece of legislation, but in respect of agriculture, it's been totally ignored by planners and by Welsh ministers. We wrote to the government, we even visited the Senate in 2019, but neither Julie James, Head of Planning, or Leslie Griffiths, Head of Farming and the Environment, had time to talk to us. They saw no reason to post Hanshe or IPUs in general. And Leslie Griffiths assured us she was working on de-intensification of farming and even had a working group to deal with it. But since Covid, I haven't heard anything else. We didn't get anywhere with NRW, Natural Resources Wales, and they also have to give their approval to any IPU application. They're meant to ensure that Welsh biodiversity is increased, not just maintained, and people within NRW have really spoken out against intensifying, particularly the poultry units. So despite our objections, demonstrations and publicity, the application was approved under the infamous delegated powers in October last year. At that point, Helen, our planning advisor, said she'd help us apply for a judicial review of the decision. And after dis discussion, we decided to go ahead with that. Helen found a barrister from the Environmental Law Foundation who worked pro bono and Buxton's lawyers, whose solicitor worked on a no, no win, no fee basis. Um, the whole legal teamwork were magnificent. We felt really privileged to have them, they were great. And the JR process was amazing. It was also one of the most stressful things I've ever done. We had wonderful support, not just locally, but nationally. People were really generous and gave donations, which meant we could go ahead. But before we actually had the JR, the council settled out of court and admitted that the manure management plan was insufficient. The case attracted plenty of media attention and was regarded as a victory. But although we were deemed to have won, as someone put it, a battle, not a war, I felt quite ambivalent about it. We were all pretty tired by the end and we knew they'd reapply. And of course, there's always some people who think we're trying to ruin the lives and well-being of local farmers, even though we always make it very clear that's not why we have this campaign. Local campaigns such as this can be awkward and divisive and pose questions that are currently not being answered by those authorities who do have the power to make the changes. What are local communities to do when governments and local councillors aren't abiding by their own laws and local politics is distinct and tribal? What is local democracy? How can local communities be included in decisions about land use and food growing when these directly affect them and their surroundings, but they own no land, never will, and have no say in policy? The chickens from IPUs aren't sold locally, they're processed and sold through supermarkets. And the proponents of IPUs defend them on the grounds that this is locally produced food, and if we don't have them, there will be more and more dodgy trade deals with countries with even lower welfare standards than ours. And they're providing, they say, poor people with cheap food. I find both those arguments really depressing and very flawed. Why not work to create a system where everybody can afford decent food, which is the theme of this conference, and get everybody working together so the dodgy trade deals and the IPUs become redundant? Rather than blaming each other, we have to be clear that supermarkets and huge companies like Cargill are screwing farmers and consumers to up their own profits and trashing the planet. And it's global. Asia and the Americas are full of intensive pig and chicken farms, which I hadn't realised before. Anyway, Clanche Farm reapplied. They added ammonia scrubbers to their initial plan and arranged to export the manure to a biodigester, which is actually 60 miles away in Shropshire, across the border, contributing to more emissions. This time, at least, there was a full planning committee hearing and Karen and I were allowed to speak. And councillors did admit that climate change is a serious concern and exporting chicken poo to Shropshire is a just-in-time policy that could easily break down. Nonetheless, we were told to take our concerns to Westminster, about uh, concerns about climate change at least, and the new application was passed 15 to 1. Now, just before all this, through the mediation of MS Jane Dodds, a couple of us, Caroline and myself, went and met a farmer who has an IPU near Llandod, and also a rep from the NFU. We were all women and Jane Dodds joined us. And both the farm and the NFU rep said they wanted to try and improve the images of farmers whom they feel are always blamed and presented in a bad light. And that was quite ironic because that's what we feel a lot of the time too. Um, it was a really good discussion. We all felt included and, and we, we listened to each other, even though we would disagree. We, we, we had a good listen and chat. And so we'd like to try and meet more farmers, including organic and regenerative farmers, but also, if possible, more so-called conventional, although there's nothing conventional about an IPU. So now we're deciding our next steps. It's unlikely we'll make any further objections or take other legal action. 
We feel at this stage it could be harmful and polarise the local community. And actually, unless we can find no new grounds for objection, it wouldn't succeed. And we could use our energy on some other projects that aren't about IPUs. But I do feel frustrated that a small group such as ours, and there's many such groups across Powys and in, in other parts of Wales and England, taking on equally Herculean struggles against IPUs, I feel frustrated any of us should be having to do any of it. Because ultimately, the government, councils and NRW aren't doing their job or abiding by Wales's own legislation. I think people here would agree that intensive farming of any kind is not a fit method of food production for the 21st century and the challenges of a changing climate. We now want to keep up the pressure on Senate members and ministers to de-intensify Welsh farming and we really love some help. We're up against very powerful corporate lobbies for corporations and individuals. It isn't easy. But we know that most of the world's food comes from plant cultivation and mixed farming methods generally produced on small farms by independent women farmers outside Europe. We need to explore and pursue this model, but how do we do it when there's no political will? That's what we're trying to work out now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Camilla. Um, thank you, for, Camilla, for, the, for an excellent presentation there. There's just so much there to pick up on. Right, okay. Um, so, Chris. Apologies, that was always going to happen, which is my firm's entire Outlook system crashed at quarter to two. So there's been complete mad panic here. Um, but look, I'm very glad to be here. For the, I, 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 I know some of you, but not most of you. I'm the new chair of the, of the Wells Inquiry of the Food Farming Countryside Commission. Um, and one of the reasons why I was asked to do this is that I'm not a familiar face in this community. I'm uh, pretty well known in public life across Wales in a number of other sectors, um, but quite a few things done. And, um, the Commission wanted us to me to bring some of that experience into the, this arena. Um, so I caught a large part of what Camilla had to say. Jane, I don't know whether you've introduced Howell or whether I should do that. No, you you introduced the rest. You can take over. I haven't done anything other than introduce Camilla. Well, I, I was hoping, um, I'm Welsh, but I'm not a, a natural Welsh speaker, and I was hoping to be in the session earlier so I could ask how, how to spell the name of his farm correctly. I didn't get that chance, so I'm going to have a punt. Um, but he farms at uh, Eska, sorry, <coughs> Eska Flies de Mlesva, um in the west end of Brecon Beacons, which is a family up, upland hill and all grass farm with very low inputs. Um, his cattle, sheep, and Welsh mountain ponies also graze on adjoining common land to, measure, to manage the vegetation. Um, but his regenerative and conservation grazing produces high nutrition red meat, which he says he sells direct to some consumers. And I'm hoping that. Um, in what he's going to talk to us about, which in, in, in essence is around the excessive uh, carbon offset forestation, is also going to include a little bit of uh, more about his farm than, than I said there, because we'd all be interested in it. So, Hal, sorry not to have met you before, but can I pass the baton on to you? Yeah, George Chris, Pran down da Paub, George Hama Guahavio, dear Kanger Levy, George Jane Trevney, I crew. Um, well, do it of Chris, um, Hoel Morgan Ureno, who do Ferman Escar Fifty, so if a da Chris, I am, um, Mavai Garsendavri and Park Branai Branai Brechenog. Um, yeah, so I'll turn to the English because I read my notes in English. Sorry, Jane, and um, everyone, but I'm a fluent well speaker, but um, for some reason, I'm more comfortable talking in um, English. Um, as Chris said, I farm with a low input system, no fert, no kang, because very little bought in feed. Some sheep feed bought in, in the spring if a grass is, uh, growth is a bit slow. Um, practice some regenerative farming um, and similar to organic system, but not certified yet. So pretty much uh, I'll talk about trees today. Um, First of all, I love trees. I plant trees. Don't know, I got lots of trees on my farm. 15% of my farm is covered in trees. Plus, I plant about 1,000 meters a year in new hedgerows and manage hedges. Um, I don't cut my hedges every year. We just trim a little bit off the side and just manage them, um, which my hedging contractor doesn't like. But I think our hedges are vital to my farming system. It's an exposed hill farm and you know, shelter from a wind and rain and from a hot sunny days is vital. So basically, currently we're seeing a huge land grab of upland farms in the area. 
by corporations, city investors, barristers and lawyers and solicitors. Um, funny enough, uh, barristers and lawyers and solicitors, they seem to know the ins and outs of these rules and they might be looking into the future because at the moment I can't see it paying. Much of this is driven by carbon offsetting and the tree planting driven by Welsh government, tree planting ambitions and the creation of a national forest, which uh, my farm is bang in the middle of the national, proposed national forest. Truly using public money to help London-based corporations to offset their carbon pollution isn't good for rural communities, the Welsh language, culture, traditions, food, security, and more importantly, our next generation farmers. We currently have lots of biodiversity habitats and you know, are we in danger of losing these to these tree plantations sort of thing? If a London-based or English-based company buys Welsh farms to offset their carbon, does that or could it make Welsh carbon, um, Wales um, carbon positive? Um, this is something I don't know, I've asked my AM, um, my MP sort of thing to pick up in the Senate of the Welsh government, which they did ask uh, Leslie Griffiths and she refused to answer them. So uh, most of our farms coming on of a market are snapped up by investors, but local agents seem happy with this and they're happy to pay, as they're happy to pay the asking price or over and the money tends to be safe. And um, I have, like I said, I, I have nothing against trees, um, but the right tree in the right place and who benefits is the key. Finding a balance between biodiversity and productivity, whether as trees or food is key sort of thing. Um, I'm concerned with what, uh, or rather what not, Welsh Government are other organisations, such as NRW, National Park, Welsh, of, uh, Welsh local authorities are actually doing currently. To put it bluntly, we are having too much talking and no action. Farmers are getting frustrated, and I'm, for, for one, really getting frustrated. I discuss with uh, Welsh Government officials quite often. I don't know, James Sowen was on earlier. I discuss with James quite often. Um, and I can't understand how one department in government can find money for tree planting. And then the next department, another department says they, they don't have any money um, waiting on the UK government to give them funding. Surely, surely with a climate emergency, um, we need to act today. You know, in three years time or four years time in 2025, when the proposed no sustainable land um, scheme comes into place, a lot of damage we've done to rural um, Wales, and especially the uplands. Um, another uh, benefit of an uh, investor buying uplands, they're having um, hectares allocated on these commons through um, a 1964 Act, Registration Act of the Commons Act, that you know, they even have hands-on extra um, land. And currently, they're having BPS, uh, like all farmers having BPS payments, but a lot of these BPS uh, payments are going to the wrong hands. Um, for example, don't know, barristers near me, they have in lots of money, I won't say how much, but lots of money just for the luxury of owning land with grazing rights and commons. Um, surely we have to change. Yes, we are changing, but don't know, another three, four years of this sort of system, we're going to do a lot of damage. The future generations, don't know, don't know, Hardly anything has been said or discussed um, uh, regarding the next generation farmers. And you know, um, you know, I got two young kids. I just become a granddad yesterday, and I am concerned about their future of if they want to farm. And you know, both my kids are keen on farming. Uh, one works on a farm, and the other one, you know, enjoys helping dad out, sort of thing. But we need opportunity. Like I was saying, the current BPS system deters um, young entrants into farming. Whether, you know, by encouraging uh, investors to buy upland farms or keep the old re semi-retired farmer on the land by, you know, giving them uh, financial support. Um, as a, is a food democracy subject, I thought I'll also point out a few facts about food security and production. 
We do currently produce enough food in the world to, to feed everyone, but distribution, government and warlords and food waste get in the way. One in nine people still are undernourished. 39% of people, adult population are overweight. And um, another stat, stat, a fact that I heard last week, that only 5% of the lamb we produce in Wales is consumed here. So now, let's get the government, schools, hospitals, local authority to eat more of the food we produce here in Wales and, that's, and not just check in. I really appreciate what Camilla just said. Um, but unfortunately, our society seems to be just want to eat chicken. Um, we need um, education in schools, agriculture callers to promote um, you know, farming with nature, maybe, and how um, the schools need to be learning about cookery lessons and teach us how to teach the children how to cook meals with a food that producer, whether it's a beef, lamb, or vegetable sort of thing. When I was on the Agri Academy Leadership Programme, Welsh Government civil servants were actually pushing as far as farmers to build chicken sheds, which I was amazed sort of thing. Um, and I'll just finish off quickly by um, just repeating my message of finding the balance between biodiversity and productivity is a key. And as Wales, you know, we, we need to make sure that this public money stays in Wales not fund the uh, London-based pension fund with, with offsetting carbon here, and eventually will that make um, Wales carbon positive? I'm not sure. God, thank you. Well, Howell, um, thank you. Um, one of the things I'd like to try and do at the end is try and pick up the themes, and I think every theme was in there. Um, that was a, a, a Pavel and. Uh, I'm going to pick up biodiversity and productivity as a as a key link in in perhaps the solution to a lot of what you're talking about. You talked about. Um, can I now introduce uh, Sean Stacy, please? Sean is product project development officer for or Money a more summit to the sea project, which we'll all have heard about, based in um, mid Wales. She's currently facilitating a co-design process with a local community as key stakeholders having worked with the project since August 2019 and has endeavoured to bring the voice of the community to the table during the original project and was involved in the transition to relaunch it in June 2020 with RSPD Cymru's hosts. Um, prior to this, Sean worked for Cohen, the food and drink programme at Menthra Business and was um, had what, I, what seems to me is the dream job of island manager at Bardsey Island um, Sean, um, you're going to talk about your project, so I'm going to pass over to you, if I may. Okay. Um, Great. Okay. So, my name is Sean, and I am coordinating the project, or Money Ir More, as it's called at present. It is a um, project, with, and, well, and I was very interesting in hearing um, the minister from the Welsh Government speaking earlier on. It'll be... Um, so... Just to, for the people who haven't heard about this project before, this project is based in Mid Wales. We take the River Dubby in the north down to the Rheidol in Aberystwyth as the boundaries of this project and um, into Llanidloes in the east and up to Plymlimon and down to the sea in Ceredigion to the west. So this is the area we work within. We have six projects, six partners in the project with the RSPB Wales um, running the project at present. Perhaps that some of you will have heard about the um, project in the past. The project, the start of the project was rather disastrous, actually. There were many different issues within the project. One of the things, which I'm sorry, it's quite noisy in Aberystwyth at the minute. One of the things I've always wanted to make sure that I share clearly with people, well, there was a very strong pushback by many in the community. But the important thing to communicate is it wasn't just a, a crowd of grumpy farmers. There were very important points. 
making people be concerned about what the project was about. So when I started, a year after the project began, my first job was to go out and listen to people's concerns and to listen um, what they were concerned about. And they, they had several um, very valid concerns. So the project restarted then, or RSPB took over as the um, ones running the project, and it changed from something who was um, operated to something which was going back right from the start and developed something which was much more local. It was driven on a local level, and local people were part of it. And because of that, we've been doing this through the project of co-designing, and I've got the next uh, slide is the plan, their co-design, as it looks. This is what my patients looks like overall. So this is what co-designing can feel like. And this is where we're at at present in the process. The important thing to say is it's important that you are comfortable and open and to feel comfortable enough to be in an uncertain situation when you um, coordinate something which co-designs. And also, we work, um, well, we don't just use this to um, make our um, engagement work look good. We do it in order to bring people from various backgrounds together and try and hold a discussion across the different communities. So, as really we've heard so far today. So it's about sharing power and um, and looking to see when there's a balance in power within communities. It's about priorities and relationships and making sure that people can take part in different forms. Perhaps holding things on Zoom doesn't always work for people and as well that we build capacity. So as far as what we've been doing, well, we started by framing the discussions and that began with workshops where we asked the question, what is the future where nature can live together? I saw in chat this morning, I can only achieve what I first imagine. So that's what the project does, help us think what a better future will look like. And from that then, we began to develop what that vision looked like and the main themes which sat within that vision. So who have we been speaking to so far? Well, we've uh, held many workshops, virtual uh, workshops, but also face-to-face -face workshops at last when the COVID guidelines allowed that. We have been developing a um, group of over 30 local people, a liaison group, which represent community groups, or local county councils, people such as um, the Farmers Unions of Wales, and many people then who try and create a situation where there are different elements of the community having a voice on the table. We also have been spending over this summer, we've been talking with businesses who earn their living from natural resources. So some people call them farms, Oh, it can also be people who work in forestry, fishing industry, any kind of business which use natural resources and they're having a f and have an effect to them. Also, people such as tourism companies, such as uh, mountain biking, etc. And that was a very good way of talking to them about the project and get their their ideas for the future and get their input into the co-design process because they own most of the land in this area so it's very important that their voice be heard. So what it, does it look like up to now? Well the vision, um, Eco's connected ecosystem from land to sea which will deliver benefits to wildlife and the people today and the future generations which celebrates the local place and culture. The four themes, again all these have come through the co-design process um, a nature rich and sustainable production system, connectivity between wildlife rich habitats for greater collective benefits, reconnecting people to land and use and sea use and nature so that people 
have a connection with how the land is managed and then reconnecting the economy. Uh, on those, we've got um, a long list of ideas from the community and we've tried to bring those and uh, five main approach and the next slide is a draft of this at the moment but we have a process of how the projects can be acted upon i'm running out of time i believe so i won't go into too much detail here i just want to mention what has worked to us in this process time is a thing i'm running out of today but time to talk time to be open to talk about a wide range of things with people and the possibility of cooperating. We've cooperated with many people on the call today, excellent people in the area, are the food surplus and the pro projects um, and with Menter Menadoid Cymru as well. And we get local people as well to help shape these ideas. So we have a team of people who are part of the project who are local people. What has been difficult? Well, the time, things like this do take time, but also we need to have an understanding that working um, on work at the pace of trust, as they say, but also there are lots of people out there who feel that we need to act now. So, you know, time for discussion is over. So you've got to have a balance between the two. Of course, COVID has been an obstacle to us. Talking over a cup of tea and Welsh cakes is always better than talking over Zoom. And also the history of the project still affects how people feel. Um, and I also have just included the co-design process for a sustainable farming scheme for Wales. Timing that has been difficult um, to develop ideas which can help local farmers, but also which are not going to um, put them on the back foot before this new scheme begins. So just a few things that have been a little bit of a challenge for us. So uh, gone too much over time, but yes, it's very exciting to take part in the discussions today. And thank you, Jane, for the welcome today. Jolk, Sean. Uh, so uh, we're gonna, it's your turn now to ask questions. Can I introduce um, Beth Bell, please? Beth is working on, a food ethics council project called food citizenship and she's going to help coordinate um the uh any questions in the discussion we're going to have Beth, do you want to talk to that a second sure thanks um and just uh thanks to jane for um for inviting me here it's just absolutely wonderful and inspiring and maddening and all those great things to um to hear from all of you um so yeah i work for the food ethics council um on uh, kind of building food citizenship movement, um, which is a movement that believes in the power of people, um, that wants to kind of have us think of ourselves as, as something more than just consumers, um, being able to recognize ourselves as citizens um, and the choices and responsibilities and rights and power um, that comes with that comes with that um, and our ability to influence food and farming systems for the better. So the better for communities, the better for farmers and producers um, and the better for the planet. Um, and I think uh, speaking to the conversation today, uh, a really important aspect of citizenship is like the conditions that are needed to make sure that everybody's voice is heard, that everybody's voice is valued. Um, so those kind of words like inclusive and accessible and respectful and equal are really important. And so too is listening. Um, so really listening to what's being said, recognizing that we're human and that we're all human. We're all, for the most part, trying to do the best we can with what we've got. Um, and really the importance of trying to understand a different point of view, even if you don't agree with it. Um, and all of that is within the kind of context that, you know, for that to work, um, we must have trust and we must have good faith. Um, and certainly I feel like there's a, an abundance of, um, of both of those things um, in the room, rooms, many rooms today. Um, so with that in mind, um, we've got an opportunity now for, um, for questions um, of the speakers um, and discussion. Um, 
I uh, will ask you um, if you want to um, ask a question to raise your hand using the uh, emojis at the bottom. Um, if you're comfortable um, to speak, do it like that. Raise your raise your hand using the emoji, and I'll and I'll come to you and ask you to unmute yourself. Um, and if you prefer just to put a question in the chat, um, and I can read the question. Um, if you just want to say in the chat who your question's for, or if it's for everybody, um, we can certainly do that too. So. Um, Anything else, Chris, before we kick off? Yeah, well, well while people are formulating their questions, um, there's, I mean, the, the theme from up to our three speakers is the action of community. You've got Hal um, talking about community, his unrest, community unrest, about what they're seeing around carbon offset forestation um, and the manner that's being dealt with. Um, then with Camilla, you've got community action, where their communities have actually gone, pulled together and done something and achieved something. Um, in their judicial review and the like. And then with Sean, we've actually got a more formal scheme that started in a planned method. So you've kind of got various grades of community action. I was wondering, maybe Sean, if I put this over to you first of all, but others please come in. What's the next step above that? And because how do we get, I mean, we've got three there. How do, we get, how do we get one plus one plus one to make four? How do we get the community voice at, at the next level? Um yeah, I think that's I think that's a really good kind of pick up from from everybody's um, discussions today. It's something that's come out quite strongly, and our co-design process is a an absolute frustration um, with people locally feeling like they're not able to influence the policy. Um, people concerned that things are happening around them, like we've heard from Howell, um, where there is a sense of a lack of being able to um, to kind of influence that. And I think in a way, the original iteration of Summit to See is perhaps also a good example of how the community got together and really pushed back against something and were very effective. Um, and I think that was, you know, uh, all praise to, to, to that actually, um, which might sound odd coming from me as someone that works from the project, but um, I kind of joined at that kind of that point of change. Um, and we've absolutely heard, you know, how, how can this project perhaps or something that already exists in the area be more of a of that kind of uh, transitionary communication tool for people locally to say we're really concerned this isn't working for us because it sounds like the things that are set up for that aren't quite working so nrw maybe isn't working properly um, we hear kind of camilla's frustrations at that um are, are the welsh government systems working you know we on paper, we've got all these amazing sounding things in Wales, the, the Future Generations Act, but how is it actually happening and, and, and being effective for us and for, for our, our nation of people? Beth, I saw in, um, in the chat room, uh, it, um, where is this? Patrick, uh, Patrick Hannay mentioning citizens' assemblies that bypass the mm -hmm. short term is of normal democracy which kind of fits into Sean's final point there which was all right Sean there are there are groups that we have in Wales and you name three of them um uh one of which I work with for Gen generation commission I work very quickly and it's it's a bunch of very able well-meaning people and, and achieving a lot but there's a sense that it, it's it's not attacking or not dealing with, with with this particular um it's not picking up here properly um I'm not the, the and I'm what's the what's it, it, it within the future generations commission within within the act it's um public service board isn't it is intended to be I'm not sure Patrick whether you think you have in mind citizens assemblies the public service boards or or something different that's a more long term form of democracy. Yeah, C can I come in, uh, Chris? Okay, I think yeah. uh, the best way to deal with this is the. Uh, is through consumers because consumers are really powerful. You know, they ultimately decide what they eat, buy, or where does the matter. But supermarkets are controlling. So, um, so I'm not sure who's in control of the supermarkets or the consumers. I think the consumers have a power, but the supermarkets have a control. So I think um, we need consumers to take take it back in their control. So the demand on food produced locally and produced to how we want it produced. Um, and just, just tell the supermarkets, this is what we want. We, if, you, if you're not happy with chicken sort of in producing big chicken sheds, 
don't don't buy it sort of thing the trouble is to know chicken is classic it's too cheap sort of thing yeah. don't know for, for what we get is it nourishment is it nutritional food at the end of the day i'm not sure um you know it's like our hospitals and schools and education government etc they've been talking for years about local procurement but they're not actually doing anything sort of thing you know let's you know if you're going to hospital or your children going to school demand on better quality food i was talking to a head teacher she has two schools in the control and she said the food in school is shocking sort of thing this is our future and we are feeding them substandard food if the human body was an engine, you wouldn't put this substandard food in that engine, would we? Well, you, I mean, you, make, you raise a fabulous point, Hal, because if, you, if the moment which the supermarkets, if we call it, got this, um, almost the problem would be fixed, look at it glibly. But Sean spoke French earlier, and she spoke better French than I can speak, but I spent a lot of time over there. And you can't buy cheap, cheap, cheap chickens in France. It's a prized product. Um, it's not a volume product, and I've often wondered how it's reached that particular um, that particular position over there as as, um, as compared over here. But as a, as consumers, consumers only have the democracy of their own spend, their individual spend. That's like their protest vote is not to buy it. What you're sort of advocating is a wider voice than that, I think. And I'm wondering whether that comes back to um, Patrick's point about um, uh, citizens' assemblies. Yeah, I might um, come to Vicky, um, I think, and Vicky said your, your hand up, but they've got a point about citizens' assemblies. I know you've put something in the chat, but do you want to share it? There was two points. One was um, about deliberative democracy, um, because you don't have to go down the exact route of citizens' assembly in order to achieve the essence of its benefits. And in Wales, we have smaller societies, so we can do non um randomised selection um, and still be inclusive, as Sean has mentioned, uh, but it is a very powerful tool which complements representative democracy to work together, they're not instead of. But coming back to Welsh government's policies and things like the um, offsetting and so on, it's very common that a good project goal is not is lost because the details are wrong. So you have to get the details right, which is another reason to go to the citizens assembly model. So offsetting is not something wrong with the principle actually, but uh, how it works out is very damaging very often. The last time I did it was counterproductive in a big way. We funded the polluters and that's being mooted again as a reason, as a thing to do, plus losing agricultural land to solar panels and forests especially close to where the food is needed like around towns is, is isn't foolishness incarnate so it's getting the details right and it's the same with you know a whole bundle of things like how you insulate how you put in renewable energy unless you get the details right it's often counterproductive at, at best I mean it's a waste of money at best counterproductive quite often so that's why you need to the citizens involved in making the decisions, but in a deliberative manner, so they're fully informed before they make any decisions, and that takes a bit of time. Uh, yeah, that'll do. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you. Um, Stephen Jacobs, I think just um, pivoting a little bit to kind of um, how to actually um, have people be informed um uh, about kind of land use and, and food food sourcing and so on Stephen do you want to say a bit about that uh yeah thank you well I think to some extent why I put in the thing was there's the need to educate or re-educate people as to value and um something Howell said earlier and I'm I'm sure we're all doing it it's just how do we how do we coordinate it? It's like how I said my kids too at school the food is appalling so we give them food to take because I'm not having them when they were little used to give them let them have a treat of having a cooked dinner there but it was so appalling even my children turned their nose up to it and there is this nonsense that oh well it's expensive well it's not because half of what you put in front of them goes in the bin so it's how do we turn all of that around whilst the vested interest the economic models of businesses is to sell more sell more sell more which is why for the last three four five decades people have known 
that that model leads to climate change that becomes irreversible and damages people's lives. And it's carrying on. But one of the things that we can say, say about Wales is, I would say about Wales, is that Wales has the potential because it has some culture left that I'm afraid is, is even less evident across England. It has some culture left. Is there enough to build upon so that we can get that value agreed amongst us? That sounds really heavy. <laughs> I'll tell a joke now. <laughs> yeah, can, can I come in there? Yeah, sure. Steve. Um, when I was on the Agri Academy, um, we had a session with uh, how to lobby government. And the only thing I took out of that session was anybody and everybody can lobby government. You don't have to be part of an union. You don't have to be part of a group. You can lobby government on your own. Now we're out of the EU. We got a devolved uh, government in Wales. And I think most of us will know either an MP or an AM or see regular basis. When it was in the EU or just UK Westminster, how often could you sort of bump into your local representative? And you know, if I can do it, sort of a meet up with politicians, where the AM, MP, you just send them an email, you know, most of them are on social media, point out what is happening. When I raised with my AM and MP about tree planting with city investors and corporations, they were totally unaware of it. And you know, they, they've thanked me for highlighting this issue for them. So you know, if you've got something you need to discuss or raise a point with your, your politician, they might not agree, but you know, they feel obliged to do something about it. Yes, as a group of people, we're stronger. But, you know, individually, we can do something. And as far for poor standard food in the school, sort of, just tell your head teacher, she, she'd be thinking the same, and she, she can help out, okay? Thanks, Howell. Yeah, lovely, thank you. Um, there's a, a bit of a, a discussion in the chats, um, Patrick and Liz. So Patrick um, Hannay is making a point around kind of getting beyond activism around what we don't want um, to activism to what we do. So that's that kind of, you know, um, imagining and sharing a sharing a, a better future. Um, yes. I can see Camilla wants to come in on what Hal was saying. Oh, yeah, sure. I just wanted to say that we really, you know, we tried, we went to the Zenith, we're prepared to go again, but it needs vast quantities of people because it's too easy to dismiss, you know, half a dozen people. I mean, I think if all the people here who feel really strongly about the lack of democracy and how much real need and desire there is for change, actually, if we could all come together and have something, you know, have hundreds of us at the Senate, it needs that. I don't think just a few people plodding along and, you know, they were all, I mean, for goodness sake, we even got to talk to, um, what's his face, Neil Hamilton. He was, oh yeah, yeah, we hate IP. You know, it's, it's got to, it needs a lot of it needs a lot of energy and and, and I, I i mean i'd be very happy to do that but i don't want to have to do it on my own or with just a small group thanks i could just start a comment on that Camilla, having you know work work lobbying um with the welsh government for, for on other projects in some time there's all it, it is also an element of focus within that because there's there's lobbying that's bound to fail and there's lobby no matter how worthy but there's lobbying that is that, that, that done properly can achieve quick change. So it's an element of um, uh, inspiration as well as perspiration in, in how one does that sort of thing. Sorry, Beth, I cut across earlier. Not at all. Um, Vicky, you've got your hand up. Is that an old hand or a new hand? Quite all right. Sorry, it was just to say that in terms of lobbying, there's a there's a there's a there's an art of process to, to success, and one of the shortcuts we can get citizens. Um, Citizens Cymru are past masters at it, and um, if we could get this agenda onto their um, table, we could work with them to achieve things. It's a suggestion, but you'd have to be members, probably. Lovely, thank you. It ties in with Mark, uh, Chris and I, sorry, we're, we're speaking earlier just about how do you get that... Um, you know, two plus two equals five. So actually um, all of these amazing pockets of, of local things that are happening, how do you kind of amplify that and, and be able to share that, um, share, the, share the things that work? Um, Liz, 
Um, I think you were making a point in the chat about um, the the kind of the, the need to both look to the future, but also kind of be really uh, be be really present in the now. Do you want to speak to that? Yeah, sure. Um, and just to kind of add on Camilla's point, I think it's incredibly important that anyone who's engaging with lobbying work has care for their own team. It's not my sense of going and talking to people who you know are ignoring you. So actually you have to build that in. Some people are very resilient on that, others aren't. But if we're about making a successful recovery, that has to be part of your plan. Um, but really the reason I kind of jumped in on, on the conversation on the chat, um, for context, I'm working specifically campaigning against genetic modification across the UK. Um, and one of the problems that we at GM Freeze have been having and other organisations are having is that it's a lot of the funding and a lot of the focus of organisations is very much on positive solutions right now. And obviously we need positive solutions, that's incredibly important. But we can't get enough money to keep going on fighting against the basics. And I think there's a danger that we kind of get a bit idealistic about, oh, you know, we've got such a great vision, that means everything will be okay. We can't drop the ball on the things that we're against. Um, if, you know, just by focusing what we thought, it won't just fall out that the bad things won't happen. Um, you know, we have to, as a movement, hold all of that. And I think uh, perhaps more in England than in, or certainly on UK wide stuff, than specifically in Wales, there's a lot of, um, but there's a whole stream of funding, the Farming the Future Fund, which is not funding anything that's about objecting anymore. Um, somebody who I won't name refers to it as all so much kumbaya, um, which I think is a little harsh <laughs> uh, because it is, you know, obviously we need solutions, but we, we can't fall into the trap of, of being the nice alternative. We have to be present in what we object to. Perfect. Thank you. Does anybody want to come in on that just before I um, move us on to talking about procurement? Everybody's favourite topic. I would just like <laughs> to say, sure. Yeah, I'd just like to say, well said. It's, it's much nicer to do things that people like you for doing. And, it, you know, you need people, you, you have to stop being afraid of not being liked. Otherwise, we won't get there. Thanks. Lovely. Thank you. Um, Steve um, Garrett, um, you've talked in the chat about kind of prioritising procurement um, around healthy local food. Um, but I've gone on to say the kind of the, the link between that and uh, building a sustainable food system. Would you say a little bit more about that, please? Yeah, well, you know, I'm generally not a fan of top down approaches to any sort of problem. And, you know, um, uh, generally change comes the other way around in my experience but th there's always seemed to me in terms of trying to create a sustainable food system for Wales the two ways in which top down would make a massive difference I'm, I mean you know, Kevin Morgan at the university has been singing about this for so long but it, it, is it too simple why can't I see what the problem is with actually prioritizing procurement from local producers it puts a huge injection of our money, uh, our tax money into supporting local producers. And yes, it's gonna cost more. And yes, it might mean a little bit more council tax. So, but my sense is that right now, there's a receptivity to the cost of actually being more sustainable, accepting that, you know, especially right now, post COP26 and all the rest of it, a general sort of interest in that. And the other way, I mean, I only just sort of tag on to that that um, governments have the capacity to run campaigns which change public opinion in ways that none of us as individual groups are able to do. You know, we did it with drink driving, we've done it with smoking. You know, why don't we have a sort of investment in a campaign that explains to Welsh people why it's a really good idea to try to source locally? And yeah, if you go to your supermarket and they haven't got it, complain. Um, you know, because I, I agree with whoever it was that says consumer power. Yeah, ultimately, it's people buying stuff that's going to affect the business model. And I said, you know, we know from our experience of the farmers markets in Cardiff, I mean, we're just a tiny, tiny little proportion of customers. But there's been a real, we, 
we're rather, we're busier than ever, to be honest, because more and more people are looking for it. I just think that there needs to be some investment in a in a, a route to market infrastructure that makes it easier for people to get this stuff and a campaign alongside that to to back that up. Brilliant. Thank you, Steve. Anybody want to come in on that? Yeah, hi, Steve. Yeah, no, good points. Um, as a farmer who produces and sells um, red meat off the farm, direct to consumers, um, there's a couple of challenges. It's really rewarding, um, not just financially, but just communicating with people that buy and eat your products, especially when they say that was good. Um, but, you know, we need sort of more local uh, processing units as for red meat production, smaller um, are dotted around the counties sort of thing, not just these big supermarket style um, processors. They have a place, obviously, to, to supply um, big supermarkets. Um, you know, currently I'm having an issue with uh, my processor and the butcher. The butchers just had an operation. So, you know, they are struggling to deal with my request before Christmas. So we do need a bit more opportunity. But as for consumers going to the supermarket and complaining, you know, go to the local shop, just go to the local butcher, sort of when the smaller the supply of a butcher, you know, the more connection there is. Um, that there's a classic example of how food production works. You know, growing food is quite simple. Most of us can do it. We obviously we need land, but the bigger the chain, there's more people involved, the more complex it gets. And I think going back to my point about the government, they've been talking about procurement for local procurement for years. Councils have. They, they just need to do it. There's too much talking. Just just do it. The facilities and are there, just do it. For example, the NRW, you know, they've given go-aheads to these chicken sheds, you know, and they know it's a broken system, but I think everybody's too scared to change or step up and or even make a mistake. I think we've got a system where a lot of these people are just too scared to make a mistake in case they lose their pension sort of thing. Um, just, just let's do it. I'm fed up of too much talking and no action, you know. Time, time's moving on, you know. We should have done something like yesterday, not in three years' time. Thank you. Um, there's quite a, a bit in kind of through the chat around uh, kind of local local supply chains, how to how to uh, how to make it easy for people not to go to, not to use supermarkets so much. Um, does anybody want to um, speak to that? That's fine. Um, I'll share a link in, in a minute just to there's a couple of organizations like the Open Food Network um, who are trying to kind of look at the, the tech that sits underneath kind of uh, what, are the, what are the things that local suppliers need to be able to manage uh, man, you know, or manage supplying lots of different shops, so they're not uh, they're not kind of bamboozled with a thousand a thousand spreadsheets. Um, okay, um, Holly, oh Camilla, I just realised that we could look to other countries. I know in France and in Italy, supermarkets. I know they produce much more food anyway in the bigger countries, but supermarkets do all have local food and. I mean, we got the co-op in night and people have asked them to stop local food, but, you know, because they have such particular standards and they want particular amounts, but supermarkets could be much more accommodating than they are. They could take the, you know, the, the misshapen vegetables and all that. And I think, again, that needs pressure. Uh, anyone? Um, we've got about eight minutes left. Um, I'm going to hand back over to Chris in a minute. I suppose we've got time for, for one more comment or question. If anybody's got anything that they um, they would really like to say before we before we finish up, can I come in with a question to um, everybody? Probably. Mm -hmm. So, like I discussed, tree planting um, and corporations investors buying up Welsh land. Um, to me, it's just the end of rural communities. It's similar to 
building reservoirs and dams to supply water to a different country. Um, what can we do to prevent the repeat of this sort of land grab again? And the fact that Welsh public money is going to offset an English company or corporation's carbon pollution, does that, and does it make our country uh, carbon positive? Isn't that something to be really worried about? And you know, Welsh government are really pushing this tree planting, isn't it? Trees, trees is part of a solution. Raising livestock uh, ruminants is, in my opinion, a lot of scientists' opinion, as good, if not better, than tree planting. I think we need the balance of, uh, of the everything. So, um, I don't know, we need to re discuss this now and really do something about it. Yeah. I, I think it's a really, it, it's really complicated and it, that's why trees is such a simple, it comes across as such a simple solution, which is why it's so easy for so many people to get behind it because it seems really simplistic. Okay, great, I can plant a tree and we're done or I can buy this patch of land and it's done, but it completely loses all of that nuance and it completely loses the people, the community, the language, um, and sometimes even the biodiversity aspect as well. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a case of how we come together to, I think that's sort of why I think within the Summit to Sea work, the narrative and the policy aspect has come out. People want to be pulling together to create a kind of counter narrative that these aren't just planes of unpeopled land without any culture or history. There's people here and there's life and you know how can we how can we demonstrate what's being done here is good but also challenge um to um to kind of always improve on ourselves um and i think that's definitely coming out from a, a lot of the farmers that i talk to in terms of you know we think we're doing good but if we're not we want to do better um but also you know as whole said fed up of being kind of lumbered with the the kind of the 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 buy the um can't remember in english the blame uh, landing landing with them um so i don't think i've got an answer for you howell but we just you know i think coming together and it's probably as appalling as thinking we need someone with a really good pr or communications head uh, to work with us to try and present something that includes the the complexity of what we all face in our every day um to counter that simplistic uh, message thank you shan um, and uh, Holly is, is just highlighting a, a session tomorrow um, uh, for anyone interested in uh, agroforestry and approach to tree planting that benefits farmers. That, that's at two o'clock in the conference tomorrow. Um, so um, I'm going to now hand back to Chris um, just to bring us on. Well, I was just wondering how to pull all this together. Um, there's a sense in the conversation, sort of David versus Goliath in a way, but one always has to remember that David beat Goliath. And as anybody who followed the story in detail would know, he was always going to because he was fleeter of foot. Um, and um, one of the senses that came through this is that those who we have bodies in Wales that are responsible for these agendas. And there's, there's a sense that they, they might mean well, but the, the concept of what they're doing isn't actually addressed at the things that they, they need to be addressing it at. And in, in that way, there's two themes that have come out of this. One is lobbying. In other words, what is it this, this movement can do? to try and persuade those people to, to, to do things in the right way and, and to, to cure the unintended consequences. Um, I think um, I think it might have been Vicky or Stephen who, who talked about how um, when um, the, 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 the tree planting initiative, the National Forest of Wales came about, you know, it, it, it sort of fell through the gap that they'd end up uh, planting on, on, on land that could be used for, for agriculture. Etc. So one is how does one uh, communicate this voice, and the second is Sean's last point, I think, which is 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 a PR and public campaign uh, that 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 wins the people over, and the lobbying wins the, the influences over people with the power to do things. It was Stephen Garrett who said that there are direct things that our government could do here, which could could um, move what we're trying to achieve here forward in the right way. One would like one would like to think that the individuals within those organisations would 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 feel comfortable on this call that they would be sympathetic to the things that one's saying, and for the reasons Howell articulated, 
whether it's insecurity or power or maybe stuck within an inadequate legislative framework that perhaps needs adapting um but there's a there are there are you can boil this complicated discussion down to a number of small things that one could do that actually could make a difference and as i started with you're very good if two and two could make five very quickly um it's been um it's been a terrific conversation thank you very much uh to all the participants thank you to camilla thank you to howell thank you to sean uh, thank you to Beth for coordinating that discussion. Thank you to Jane for organising it. Apologies again for my systems crashing. I've been sitting here with my fingers and toes crossed. They weren't going to crash again, but they haven't. Um, so I hope you found that discussion interesting. Um, I hope we can catch the, the chat room and then have a discussion offline about what it is we do next. I'll certainly be taking these points and my um, extensive notes of the conversation back to the Food Farming Countryside Commission. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.